Hi there, my latest instrument for the bench is this vintage RMS voltmeter from Ray Caldana, model 9300. It does only one thing, and that is measuring AC voltages, but it's true RMS. The meter is built like a tank, enclosed in this massive aluminum frame with two thinner sheets on top and bottom. I did clean the outside up as far as possible, but the scratches and nicks of a long service life remain of course. The rear shows an IEC mains power inlet with fuse and a BNC output. A black strip hides the holes for a remote control option that isn't fitted to this meter. It came with a handle but I removed it because it just gets in the way since I'm not planning to move it around a lot. You may wonder why I got this old analog meter since I already have several digital meters capable of measuring true RMS. Well, as a start, just look at the range switch. The lowest range is 100 microvolts. None of my other instruments come close, let alone at the frequency the 9300 can deal with. Here's a list of candidates I have in my lab that can measure AC true RMS in a millivolt scale at frequency of at least 1 kHz. I have also indicated the accuracy in the usual audio frequency band and at the highest specified frequencies. The troublesome part is often well hidden in the data sheets, usually in form of a small note stating that the quoted wonderful accuracies are only valid if the signal is sign shaped and the level is at least X percentage of the range. Below that, your meter is just telling you nonsense. Hence the Solartron 7150 Plus with its 200 millivolt lowest AC range needs to see at least 20 millivolts and if you go faster than 100 kilohertz you pay with extra hours. For the 3441A it's much the same. 10 millivolts at least to be in spec. At a crunch 2 millivolts with additional error but you have to use less than 50 kilohertz. The same is true for all other meters. The HP 3478A needs to see at least 30 millivolts. The Poheimen 869S at least 50 millivolts or possibly only 25 millivolts but then with an 80 digits uncertainty added which kind of makes this lower limit not very practicable. The Ovon XDM 1041 seems to be better with 25 millivolts nominally and as little as 5 millivolts with an additional error factor until you realize it's limited to 1 kHz only. The cheap and humble AN8008 is interesting. It has an incredibly 10 mV AC range and I measured that it agrees reasonably well with my Rigel scope down to 50 microvolts RMS. Too bad that it's limited to 1 kHz. To be true, I had completely forgotten about this 10 mV range and I only rediscovered it when I made this table for this video. I could have saved me a lot of trouble if I had remembered the sensitivity of the good old AN8008 when trying to recalibrate the 9300. This leaves the two scopes. The Rigel 1054Z software limit bandwidth is changed to 100 MHz but its gain accuracy is only 3% above 10 mV or 4% below. I consider a signal of one division peak to peak as the practical limit which translates to about 1 mV. The Rigel can calculate and show true arm as directly. The O1 HTS 272S scope is limited to 10 mV per division and 70 MHz bandwidth. It has the same 3% gain accuracy which I confirmed in one of my latest videos. Technically this scope cannot show true arm as directly but you can export the waveform as a spreadsheet and then calculate it yourself so I included it in the list. Well compared to all the others the 9300 is really a one trick pony. It can only do one thing and that is measuring true RMS AC voltages but it does that very well as you can see. From 300 volts to just 30 microvolts and it can do that over a wide frequency range. Normally it's specified to 20 MHz but it can normally be used about double that frequency. Its accuracy specification is rather complex. This here are the key values somewhat simplified. Because the real thing looks like this table in the 9300 manual. The slope on the right indicates that you are not allowed to put in very high voltages with very high frequencies. This is simply because the impedance of capacitors drops with increasing frequency and at high voltages some significant currents would start to flow. 
you may notice that this table is called the accuracy of the DC output and indeed this is one of the key features of the 9300 which made me getting it. That BNC socket at the rear you saw earlier is a DC output and intended to be used with a digital voltmeter so it can read and even record the measured AC values comfortably and with much higher accuracy than eyeballing the analog meter on the front and using the mirror scale to eliminate parallax of the needle. The DC output is always fixed to 0 to 1 volt. The only thing to remember is that you still need to apply some scaling depending on what range was selected. For example, in the 100 millivolt range, if the DC output shows 0.8 volts, the meter is measuring an AC RMS voltage of 80 millivolts. Or in the 30 millivolt range, a DC output of 0.948 volts means the AC RMS voltage is exactly 30 millivolts. Sounds complicated, but it's not too difficult to keep a little conversion table with the scaling factors for all 11 ranges. Opening the top reveals all the goodness inside this unit. The PCB is dual layer, all through hole, and the top carries a silvered ground plate for shielding which makes it tricky to video because of reflections. I found a QA sticker stating that this unit was assembled and tested on the 9th of July 1984, almost 38 years ago. Because of that, I decided to replace the power supply caps with new ones from Vichy and do one other change, but first let's have a quick look around. This unit uses 7 relays, 3 are hidden under the shielded area. I color them yellow here. The relays do the range switching. This has the advantage that no sensitive signal wiring has to travel to the range switch and back, keeping the range switch itself simple because it only needs to switch DC. The second advantage is that it makes it fairly easy to add remote control to the range switching which was an option that could have been installed at this location here. Despite the initial impression, this unit is almost completely built with individual transistors. There are 11 distributed on the PCB, but then there are these 6 transistor arrays, each containing nothing but 5 transistors that are on a common substrate and therefore closely matched in electrical and thermal behavior. Going even further, for this unit, Rekel engineers measured the arrays to select three matching ones. Sadly, the manual does not say what criteria they were looking for. They have marked them with colored dots. One would need to replace them as a set to keep the performance in spec. There are two quad op amps ICs marked in green apart from some resistor arrays and the regulators for the plus minus 15 volts coming from a linear power supply. The shielded box contains the input circuitry, which is of course especially sensitive. Next to it are the two huge electrolytic capacitors for the power supply. It took me ages to get the capacitors out because they were actually glued in and that glue had not lost anything of its sticking power. And here goes cap number two. Now for cleaning off the residue before the new caps go in. The new caps are quite a bit smaller than the old ones but the ones I picked have an excellent lifetime of 6000 hours at extended temperature range. I leave the Vichy part number in the description if anyone is interested. I did apply a double sided tape underneath the caps like the originals and since these caps are smaller I added some double sided tape in between them as well. Before the next modification I think it would be useful to briefly look at the schematics to see how this unit works. It's quite ingenious in my opinion. The service manual is very detailed and explains the theory of operation in all details. It also contains this block diagram. There were basically two problems that the designers had to solve. The first one is quite obvious, how to convert an AC signal into a DC voltage that is equivalent to its true RMS value. This magic is basically happening in this block here and the service manual contains pages and pages of dense math equations showing how and why this all works. It's hard to follow and I can only admire the knowledge of the designers that came up with this in the first place. As part of this process, the signal gets amplified quite a bit and this introduces a second problem, namely how to eliminate the noise caused by the front end circuitry that inevitably gets amplified as well. For that, they introduced a noise generator, basically a simplified copy of the input circuitry that isn't connected to any input signal, so its output represents just the produced noise part. 
a simple pulse oscillator switches for about one millisecond in every second the signal processing chain from the real input to the noise generator. An auto zero offset is then produced and fed into the signal processing so that it reduces the output coming from the noise generator to zero. That auto offset is then kept in a sample and hold circuit so it can still be used to correct for noise when the signal processing is switched back to the real input signal. Finally, during the one milliseconds of producing the auto offset, the meter and the DC output are disconnected from the signal processing but the last value is kept by another sample and hold circuit to make the auto zero adjustment process completely invisible. This is part of a schematic showing just the power supply and the front end circuitry. The power supply is totally conventional with the two voltage regulators producing plus minus 15 volts and ground. However, the one interesting bit is that the signal ground is different from chassis ground which is connected to mains earth. If the isolate switch is open, the signal ground is floating with respect to mains earth but protected by two antiparallel diodes so the voltage difference between the signal ground and the mains ground is limited to around plus minus 0.6 volts. Ingeniously, they simply used a full bridge rectifier for that job the black square with the number 8411 on it, allowing them to do the protection directly in the front panel wiring. The two optocouplers represent a switching between the real input circuitry and the noise generator represented by these components. Not seen here, the LEDs in the optocouplers are driven by the pulse generator, one from the normal output and the other one from an inverted one. Either of the two sources is then connected to the signal processing chain through C15 and R14. The replacement of R14 is my next job, because this is a simple and noisy carbon film resistor and since it's right at the beginning of the signal processing chain, it should really be a metal film type. This mod is one recommended by folks having a 9300 to reduce the noise at the output further. The signal processing has a couple of stages with attenuators and amplifiers all controlled by relays and finally ends in the squarer and averager to produce the output of the meter and the DC output at the rear. Up here in the upper right is the pulse generator and the two output signals which are inverted from each other. That is not very obvious because the schematics does not show which inputs are positive and negative inputs of the op amps. I added that in this drawing for these two. One last remark on the schematics. There is a later model of the 9300 out there, the 9300B. It has a slightly different enclosure but exactly the same PCB and schematics. The only difference is that the tolerance of a few resistors have been improved from 1% to 0.1%. However, the specs of the two models are identical, so I suspect the tolerance changes are simply to make the calibration faster. R14 is in the shielded area. To get the shield out from under the mains power switch actuator, I actually had to remove the actuator from the front panel. That stiff blue ribbon transfers the push action from the front to the switch at the rear which keeps the mains well away from the sensitive front end. Shielding continues on the solder side, which means this will have to be removed as well. With the top shield gone, the input section is finally revealed. In this shot, two of the three relays normally hiding in there are visible on the top. Zooming in and the two 6-pin optocouplers that do the switching between real input and noise generator are clearly shown. They have also been specially selected for matching characteristics, hence the matching grey colored dots next to the 403 number on them. R14 itself is on the left of the blue tantalum capacitor C15 and just above C16. To be able to desolder R14, the shield on the solder side has to be removed by unscrewing the hex standoffs. Nicely visible are the ferrite beads that suppress very high frequencies on the shielded cable coming from the input socket. The new metal film R14 in its place. It looks alarmingly small compared to the others, but this resistor is rated for a quarter watt like the one it replaced. It has a 1% tolerance compared to the 5% of the carbon film type. The first test, does it still work? Well, it does power up and no smoke, so that's a good sign. For a quick test, I decided to connect my 5V AC reference signal for my DMC Check Plus. 
The meter is in the 30 volt range, so the needle should be halfway between 0 and 1 on the lower black scale, which it does. Switching to the 10 volt range, yes, pretty much half scale or 5 volts if you consider that the camera has a slight offset. Reading 5 volts also shows that the meter is true RMS because this is not a signed signal and meters that are not true RMS would show 5.5 volts. I decided to do a recalibration because I replaced R14 and also because I thought one really ought to at least check its accuracy since I don't know anything about this meter's past. From the cull stickers it was 15 years or so out of cull anyway. The procedure is elaborate and I spent a whole Sunday doing this in many iterations mainly because I had to improvise at some steps. The main problem was how to produce a 1 kHz input signal of exactly 3.162 mV here and 0.3162 mV there if none of my generators have a way to set such output voltages reliably or not at all and all my meters can't measure such low voltages either. This is where the AN8008 would have been extremely useful and eventually, one rainy Sunday, I planned to verify my cal using the AN8008 at 1 kHz. Anyway, in the end I used attenuators, so instead of 3.162 mV, I set the generator to produce 10 times as high, 31.62 mV, which is comfortably over the 10 mV limit of the 3441A. The 9300 was fed through a divide by 10 attenuator to get the desired voltage of 3.162 mV or by a divide by 100 to get 0.3162 mV as needed by the procedures. The XDM1041 was monitoring the DC output and allowed me to adjust the trim pots and capacitors in the 9300 to get the desired 1 volt as close as possible. There's more to this, especially when going to higher frequencies, but that's in principle how I did it. There isn't actually anything that is reasonably easy to demonstrate of the circuit itself, but at least I can show you the pulses that switch the meter between measuring and noise zeroing. Here are the outputs that go to the two optocouplers. The distance between the two needle pulses is roughly one second. This is where the meter actually measures the input signal and zooming in and adjusting the trigger position shows that the pulses are just a little longer than one millisecond. During this time the input is disconnected and the meter determines what internal noise it needs to compensate. Oh, and I'm sure you are as curious as I was, are these 38 year old electrolytic caps still any good? Well, the first one is slightly low on capacitance, 2.02 .02 instead of 2.2 millifarad but the electrolytic caps generally have a large tolerance from factory, so I consider this normal. ESR with 0.1 ohm is quite decent. The second one is closer to the nominal value, but still slightly below. It has the same ESR. I also tested both for leakage and they were fine. In a nutshell, these probably have a few more years of life in them and did not need replacing. Anyway, it's done and I'm certainly not putting them back in. Finally, I was thinking of what application I could use to show the meter in operation. In the end, I decided on a little amplifier, as minimalist as possible, made entirely from the spare parts bin. In concept, this amp is very similar to the one I improvised at the front end of my frequency counter mod, link in the description if you haven't seen it. It is built on a breadboard and there's one additional 33k resistor to ground at the output because both the scope and the 9300 have a very high input impedance so it takes forever for this cap to discharge. First let's measure the amplitude of the 1 kHz signal I feed into the amp. The over meter at the back shows the 9300's DC output. Lowering the range until we get a good reading which is pretty much exactly 10 mV RMS. This means the DC output needs to be multiplied by 10 to get 10.2 something millivolts. Before connecting the meter to the output, we need to select a less sensitive range. This meter has no auto ranging, so it's the operator's responsibility to think ahead. Once the signal is connected, I can again lower the range to get a good reading. This is the 1 volt setting, so the output signal as shown on the over one is 0.655 millivolts RMS. It follows that this little breadboard 
amplifies 10 millivolts about 65 times to 650 millivolts RMS. That was at 1 kilohertz. Let's try sweeping the frequency from 100 hertz to 1 megahertz and see how linear the little amp is over this range. The sweep time is 10 seconds and the 9300 is connected to the output of the amplifier. You can see periodically that the needle drops somewhere at presumably higher frequencies and the oven display shows of course the same. For a clearer picture you can of course record the amp output voltage while changing the frequency. This is why I love this particular RMS meter with its DC output. I can easily set up my multimeters to record the DC out from the rear of the 9300 in a simple script that also controls the frequency of the function generator. The result is this graph which goes actually to 10 MHz but as we saw there is a significant drop at 1 MHz already. I think for what I paid which was 60 pounds or 80 dollars for two, one working and one for parts, this is a great meter. It may be 38 years old but still going strong. Of course, with anything bought used, there's a risk of something seriously wrong or at least a need for recalibration. I'm glad having a spare one, as so many parts in this meter are specially selected and should only be exchanged as a group. Hopefully repairs won't be necessary for a long time and I plan to use this meter in future videos where there is a need for AC2 RMS measurements. So if you have not subscribed already, hit that button and the notification bell so you don't miss the next videos and maybe consider becoming a Patreon, link in the description. As a Patreon you get early access to videos, a blog and other exclusive content. Thanks for watching.